gentlemen, for the people who do not know me, my name is Michiel Minneker, I'm the Managing Director of World Press Project. <laughs> and uh, also on behalf of FOB, I would very much like to welcome you here at uh, the Open Lecture. Every year, as some of you might know, we organize or we invite one of the participants of the Masterclass to um, actually expose himself to a much larger uh, public than uh, the Masterclass in itself. And this year it's even more special because it's the first time that we will do this session on a live streaming. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, experiment for us. So I also welcome all the people who are now watching us on their computers. Um, welcome. Let me just briefly introduce uh, David Burnett. David Burnett launched his photographic career in 1967 as an intern at Time magazine. He went to Vietnam as a freelance photo journalist in 1970 and was one of the last photographers hired by life. He then, he then joined the French agency Gamma before co-founding Contact Press Images together with Robert Pledge. In a career that spans over 30 years, Burnett has, no, has won numerous awards, including in 1979 the World Press Photo of the Year and the Robert Capa Gold Medal. He has worked in over 70 countries, covering subjects ranging from American presidential elections to famine in Ethiopia and four Olympic Games. I know that he will hate me for this, but I would very much like to invite forward the master with capital M, David Burnett. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, as I, I was trying to write, a, you know, you have to write a few notes when you do one of these things, especially when you know that somebody that you've never met in Fiji is watching it on a little iPhone. And, hi. Um, <coughs> hi, Jordan. <coughs> hi, Iris. Um, you got, if you don't say hi to your wife and your kid, like, don't come home. But I, it's, what is absolutely true is that this is the probably the first time in my life and for a whole week and that I will have been referred to as master and I can guarantee you that by the time I get off the plane in New York those days are over. <laughs> but uh, this has really been terrific. Uh, I want to first of all thank uh, everybody from World Press and Home who's hosted us this week but uh, as usual the unbelievably great World Press Photo team has just like made this a fabulous experience. Uh, Evelyn, Laura, Sebastian, uh, Sander, who's somewhere. Um, he's the one with that big roll of white tape that he's running around taping everything up so we don't trip. Uh, Ruth, Manya, Charmaine, and uh, of course, Nikhil, thank you for twisting my arm to get me over here. Um, Nobody does anything in photography that I've ever been associated with as well as these people do, and it's, uh, it's fitting that this is a master class because uh, not only is it a, perhaps, something, uh, you know, if you're one of the participants, I still, I mean, we're all friends, I can't see it's as masters, okay, I'm still having trouble with that word. But the master here is really the people who put it all together and make it available uh, for a dozen photographers, and their editors and photographer friends to come together for this week. It's, uh, I'm never quite sure that, that my participation in these things is beneficial to the participants or students uh, when I do workshops, but I will guarantee you that it's been terrific on my part, so if they get even half out of what I think I have, um, done deal. Uh, actually, I have not been a photographer for the better part of 30 years. I've been a photographer for the better part of 40 years. So I guess I need to update the bio a little bit, but um, like Jan Garo, who gave a wonderfully moving little mention of this the other day in his, uh, his description of what grabbed him about photography, I was a 16-year-old high school kid looking for some activity outside of my studies, and I uh, applied to the high school yearbook staff, which are the people who do those big photo books and the pictures of all the kids in the class, and more importantly, the picture of the French club and the... Latin club and the football player. So I applied when I was 16 and they accepted me for the cl uh, 
class the next year, and the first time, the first day of school, when I walked into the dark room, and Mr. Blackman, the math teacher, uh, photography advisor, took a piece of paper out from under the enlarger, uh, put it in the deck tall, and up came this amazing picture. Well, I mean, it was the French Club, so it wasn't that amazing. <laughs> but the act of this life coming out of this sheet of white paper was just transforming for me, and I think we, we probably have worn that happily for, since, our, since our youth. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to work in, in a, uh, an area that you enjoy, and I, um, I'm a freelancer, I have an agency, Contact Press Images, we've been going uh, as an agency for about 30 years. I work a lot, I work hard, but I never have really felt like I had to go to a job. And I kind of bless my, uh, my cameras and the world of photojournalism for that. It's, uh, I understand that I'm kind of in a privileged situation like a lot of photographers who are working in the world these days. We actually get to go take pictures and maybe even pay the rent with it. Pretty good deal. It started, uh, I started right after I had been, uh, uh, after school started, I began seeing other ways to uh, handle my photographs. I would photograph the uh, high school football games and basketball games in the neighborhood, run the film down on Friday night and try and sell it to the local paper. After first, and this is always something that's worth remembering, first finding out where their own photographers were not going to be so that you wouldn't have to compete with them. Occasionally they'd run a picture, I'd get a credit line in the paper, they'd give me five dollars, which doesn't sound like much now, especially at a dollar forty-four per euro. <laughs> but in those days, that would buy you five rolls of triax, which would be, you know, reinvested and reinvested, and eventually you could have a million rolls of triax. But I had the bug, and uh, I, I kind of got through college, uh, first as a, a math major, that didn't work out, then political science. But I understood all the way through, even if my parents didn't, that I wanted to be a photographer. And so I never, after a while, I just stopped making uh, a big deal out of it. I just said, yeah, okay, poli sci, great, international relations, I'm right there. Got my degree. But I knew from the time I was 17 that I was going to be a photographer. And nothing, uh, as I tried to explain to my daughter, who's a, 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 her last year of college studying musical theater, when you want to do something so bad that that's the only thing in your sight, that's really the way to get it done. You can't share it, you can't really uh, divide your enthusiasm. You have to just focus on it and go at it. Those were the days of the late 60s, early 70s. I had a summer job with Time Magazine and was always trying to get on with life because that was kind of like the big, the big deal, the big picture magazine. And eventually, uh, once I got to Vietnam, I, I did uh, work with them the last year that they were going. Uh, see, in the old days, that would have meant that the guy had just come from the airport with the film. But uh, we don't get to do that much anymore. Um, anyway, I'm going to jump in here and show you a bunch of pictures. It's probably way too many pictures. Uh, they look pretty good up here. They're not like a 30 by 40 inch die transfer or a beautiful gigantic laser thing. You know, we're still dealing with this new projection light thing. So imagine just that they probably look a little tweakier than they might actually look on, on screen here. But just run with me, if you will. I went to Vietnam in 1970 and uh, every time somebody asks me about it, so who sent you to Vietnam? And I always kind of respond with the country western song which begins, I bought a one-way ticket to Saigon. And that was really, I guess, how my career started. I had worked for a little while in uh, Washington and Florida. But Vietnam was the story, much as the Middle East generally, I suppose, and Afghanistan and Iraq are in particular right now, except that, uh, generally speaking, I think Iraq uh, has turned out to be far more dangerous than Vietnam. You could never imagine saying that up, up until the last five years. No, no one would ever have believed that that would be possible. But when you see the restrictions on being able to work in Iraq now, it's, it's really terrible. In Vietnam, uh, and maybe you, the last time the Pentagon has its way, you could basically, with your press card, go to the airport, 
look for a plane going to some place you wanted to go, go up to a fire base, hang out with a bunch of guys. It just didn't take anything to hook up and be part of what was going on, at least on the American side. Interestingly enough, after the war ended, uh, and 10 or 15 years later, through people like Tim Page, they were able, uh, a number of people got together and were able to finally publish a book of the ph photographs done by North Vietnamese photographers. Uh, some amazing uh, work, and it, and it really uh, was something to give you a whole other, you know, they had, they, believe me, they had no airplanes and no fancy trucks or anything, they had, they walked. And they would, you know, the stories from some of these guys, they would give them three rolls of film and they'd be gone for a year. Kind of re, uh, uh, reinvents your respect for knowing when to push the button. And I spent a couple of years, this was at a, a show up in Da Nang for uh, a Bob Hope and a bunch of dancing girls from Hollywood show. I'm not sure they do them quite like that anymore. They don't seem to do it quite the same way. This was a camera fixed to a spotter plane over Antlock. I happened to be up in Trang Bang with Nick Ut and a few other journalists the day that Nick took his very famous picture of the girl on the road. And it was one of those, i just tell you a little bit about this story, which was so amazing because when you're present at the making of an iconic picture, and it's not you making it, it gives you a very, you know, a lot of people have said to me, well, aren't you really ticked off that you didn't, you know, you didn't make that shot? And absolutely not. I mean, that was, that picture was meant to happen in Nick Gutt's camera that day. And I was, I had an old knob wind uh, Leica that I kept having trouble trying to load. And the planes came in and dropped a napalm, and I'd take a couple of pictures and try and load this camera. And at one point, a bunch of people came running out from behind this building here, which is the pagoda, to the road and up the road, and Nick and two or three other people immediately realized what had happened, and they all started running down the road. And it took me another few seconds to get the film loaded in my camera, and I ran down there. None of this happened in still pictures. It happened in that life continuum, just like it exists for us right now. We ran down the road, the kids came running up the road. This was just like seconds after that moment that he took the picture. And the guy in the center here is pouring water on her burns. And it seemed like just another crappy day in, in Vietnam where uh, innocent people were injured and hurt. And they ran the kids down the road and eventually uh, Nick put them in his car, took them to the hospital. And I was shooting for the New York Times that day, so I went back to the AP office and we all kind of congregated back at the AP. And Nick was developing his film, my film was being done by one of the lab technicians, and while I was waiting for mine, Nick walked out of the dark room with the first print, the first time anyone had ever seen the photograph of Kim Fook and the kids on the road, and, and Nick, who's about this high, was showing it to Horst Foss, the multi-Pulitzer Prize winning photographer from the AP, who was a big guy like this, big booming voice, and Nick was kind of small and very self-contained, and Nick was holding this print in his hand, and and we're all looking at this picture, and I'm thinking, boy, that's, you know, it's a pretty good picture. And uh, and Horace kind of just looks at it and says, well, you do good work today, Nick, I'll go take it to PTT, let's send it. And they had a few discussions about whether they could send it because of the AP rules about frontal nudity, and, and finally they just said, this picture's too good, we're sending it. And at that moment, only three or four people in the whole world had seen that image. And to me, I went back to the office, I wrote to Life magazine, and I sent a couple pictures to, to uh, the New York Times, but I wrote to Life, who was my main uh, client then, and I said, here's my film from Trang Bang. Nick got from AP, got a couple of really good pictures, check with AP in New York, maybe you can get an original print made from the negative and not have to go with a wire service picture. The next day, it was obvious that a billion people had seen that photograph. And it started to take on a whole other meaning, both for the everybody involved, for the kids and the attention that we were at least able to bring to them to get eventually get them some medical care, to Nick for all the uh, awards he won in photography. And, and for those of us who were just there, it was just like one of those moments when you kind of cross in this cosmic three-dimensional space uh, 
you sort of are there where a picture got made that became one of those pictures that everybody saw in the world and that would, you can describe it in five words and there isn't anybody over the age of 25 who doesn't know exactly what the picture is. So it's this amazing power of visual communication and sometimes it's, uh, I don't say it's maybe a privilege, but it's just, it's a, it's a fascinating thing to be present in a moment like that when a picture is made that's become such an icon. I was still a young photographer and probably not very good when I look back at my work. It's, uh, it's sort of okay. I'm not really sure I would have ever hired me, but thankfully somebody did. But as all things, at the end I was 24, 25 years old and you start to understand that you, you look for your own style, you look for those things that you feel can let you express yourself as a photographer. Finding that way of working that, uh, that will let you connect with a picture that people somewhere else can actually look at and get something out of, which is really the whole point. And this is probably the first picture I ever took that I would have said was a, a good picture. And it was the first photograph I ever did that, that I ever got a letter from. I got five letters from people in the U.S., including one incredibly touching handwritten note from a woman in Kansas who said how much it reminded her of when she was a nurse in World War II. And, uh, and then there was this like 30 year gap before I got my next letter about a photograph. And of course now in email, the interesting thing is, is that when you have a picture published in a magazine or a newspaper, in hours you can, you, you'll hear from people and um, it's so easy to be in contact, you don't have to really struggle so much to find out how to reach a photographer and it's sort of nice actually to hear what people have to say. After I left uh, Life Magazine Clothes and I joined Gamma, one of the first stories I did was the coup d'etat in Chile. And um, I spent about two weeks down there, I was with the first group of journalists that got in and it was one of those things where it was not a real big story in the United States, I guess suppose partially because the U.S. government was sort of complicit with, with it, but in Europe it was an enormous story and um, this was in the basement of the National Stadium where I had been arrested the day before taking pictures and when we went back on a little press tour. I knew exactly the hallway I wanted to go down and as we were waiting to get in there they brought in some more students who had just been arrested including this guy whose face sort of became in many ways the, uh, the face of the, of the coup. And I never for more than 30 years I avoided wanting to know what happened to this guy because I figured nothing good. Uh, as it turned out, about four years ago, they, I was in touch with a Chilean editor and a couple of friends of mine had said, you know, you really need to find out because this picture was, a, you know, I was, I kind of didn't want to know what the answer would be. Anyway, we, they ran a little piece in, the, in a newspaper in Santiago and the next day somebody called and said, oh, that's Daniel Cespedes who lives down in Rancagua. And I haven't been back to Chile yet, uh, but we have been in touch and they did uh, a, a quite moving story about him called The Man in the Picture. You know, there's, a, there's four or five pictures that have taken place in our lifetime that you can say the person in the picture and everybody knows what it is. And in this case, it's Danielle, who's still living near Santiago, General Pinochet. This is people who were waiting to find out what had happened to their family outside the National Stadium. And the poet Pablo Neruda, who died just after the coup and whose funeral was really the last gathering of the, of the left in Santiago. I was able to, uh, working with a number of magazines, Time Magazine being one of them, uh, through Contact, my uh, agency, which we had offices both in New York and Paris, and always trying to cobble together assignments. I ended up in 1979 in Iran. Uh, actually, Christmas Day of 78, I arrived there, and 
I'm currently working on trying to get a book together for next year of these pictures, and uh, it's so interesting to go back 30 years later after you've after you've done a story. And the one thing I would really admonish all photographers in this room: write stuff down. Don't think you're always going to remember what, who, where, the name of somebody that you met in a crowd that day. You will not remember it. It's like your memory is like a hard drive. At some point, it will not be working. And uh, I'm discovering it. <laughs> my hard drive conked out a little quicker than I'd hoped. And um, but going through these photographs has really been been uh, an amazing experience to look back at this stuff and try and put back together the. the when I arrived there, it was just the the revolution was really in in gear. And I was there for the final days of the Shah and the return of Khomeini and the change of power, and it was it was really something. Pretty hard for me to believe it's 30 years, actually, but that's what the calendar says. This was in the days when still shooting film, and, you know, digital, nobody even knew what digital meant in those days. You shot your film, you'd go to the airport, and you would do the first thing they tell you now in an airport not to do, which is to find someone you don't know and convince them that the fate of the free press relies on this film being delivered in London, Paris, or somewhere that you can get it to your people. It was so important, and we had no, sh no way to ship. There was no, FedEx hadn't been invented yet. DHL didn't exist yet. Uh, Pan Am was still flying a little bit, but there was no cargo service. So you just had to find somebody in the uh, waiting area and convince them to take your film. We never lost a single package or a single roll of film. And I think I probably shipped 30 times in the time that I was in Iran. Every time I hear that announcement out in the airport, saying, do not accept anything from someone you don't know, and all I can think of is, what about all these people that have to ship film? What are they going to do? <laughs> But in many ways, it was really, uh, it was incredibly uh, photogenic, if that's the word for it, uh, time. A little frightening. I, you know, I didn't speak any Farsi, so half the time I didn't really know what was going on, but I just had to <coughs> see and try and glom onto it by, by watching. And, you know, it's, this is basically, this is what happens, the way people, different people react when gunshots go off. The day before Khomeini returned, the Shah's troops drove through town and some students yelled at him. They fired on the students, they killed one guy, and uh, these kids just gathered around, dipped their hands in his blood to show that another martyr had died for the cause. This is a picture that's also known as the um, We talked about it yesterday when we were talking about uh, things that, that are too symbolic and too overused, but in fact, this really, at the time, in 1979, the Shador really was, it wasn't yet cliché, it was really a statement. I managed to talk my way into Khomeini's uh, little room in a school where he was headquartered, and it, I must say, I don't know if it was fast talking so much as I, I just wore the guy down. He was an economics professor. He couldn't really understand why all the press couldn't get together and just divide up things instead of having to answer all these different requests from people. And uh, since he didn't really have much to say or to offer, most people stopped going to his briefings. But I kept going every day they had a briefing. And finally, the fourth day, he just couldn't take it anymore. He said, come on, let's go. And minutes later, we were inside the room. When you have a situation like this, you just want to take advantage of everything you can. Just You never stop shooting. You try and make yourself, you just do one of these, I'm going to disappear so they don't even know I'm here. And I was in a little room that was about 10 by 10. And basically, I don't really think he knew I was there. And if he hadn't had to go to prayers after half an hour, I could have stayed in there all day. In Ethiopia in 1984, uh, the famine up in uh, the country north of Addis uh, 
again, shooting film, trying to hitch, hitch rides. And it, it's so interesting when I look on some of the websites now that are dedicated to photojournalists, how codified and how much information sharing there is. It's just, it's a fairly recent thing now with the internet and the ability to share this information is quite amazing. And at the time, you know, you just would try and go somewhere and look for, you know, find out where things were and go there and make your pictures. And even in a refugee camp, you can find a moment of love. I'm going to run through just a bunch of different things. I mean, I have a little show that I put together a couple of years ago, about 50 pictures. And it's just a real potpourri of stuff. And every time I get it up on the wall, I look at it and I say, God, one guy did all this? And I was that guy? <laughs> so this is a little bit of that. I mean, it's, it's, I'm going to just go through it real quick here. Bob Marley. I think we have another book on Bob Marley coming up maybe in just about a year. For a guy who never did a book, like uh, Christoph, I mean, a little bit later in my career, I may actually get two books in a year. <laughs> Fingers crossed farmer who just lost his farm in the uh, financial crisis of the early 80s. John Paul II in New York. This is the, uh, the day that martial law was declared in Poland in December of 1981. I had gone there to cover the Lech Wałęsa for the Time Man of the Year story and the day after I got there everything changed. Boris Yeltsin at a campaign meeting, and yet another example of the only good reason to have tele pardon the expression, the only good reason to have television people in the room when they flip on a light from the side. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been happy to buy him a beer that night, but uh, this was in New York, the first year anniversary after 9-11. In Kandahar, some Baluch rebels. This was before the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. And I'd been doing a story on Baluchistan. Had been in Kuwait for a couple of weeks and went up to Afghanistan for a couple of days and met these guys. American troops in Grenada, 1983. Little Holga picture of a Marine... Uh, Flight Mechanic, Ayers Rock in Australia, Uluru, by its proper name, Elian Gonzalez, the little Cuban boy who'd been, uh, who tried to escape with his mother, she'd been drowned, she was living with, he was living with uh, relatives in Miami, and then eventually when his father came from Cuba, the U.S. government handed him back over to the father. And they were getting terrible press, and I called somebody I knew who was involved in the case. I said, you people really need to have somebody hang out with this guy, with the kid and his dad, who is a, who's not involved. The first pictures they had given out were shot by their lawyer. I said, you know, that doesn't really add a lot of credibility to your situation. So I kind of talked my way in to spend an hour with Elian. And, you know, moments like this, it's like, you know, the kid has to be with his dad. Diana's wedding. Two boats on the Nile just south of Cairo. The Otiti apple tree, and which, you know, you got out, I got out of the car and I walk over and I see these amazing leaves sitting on the ground from this tree. And it's not much of a picture. And then Gilbert the Wonder Dog comes over to chase me away. You know, sometimes. <laughs> You just hang around long enough, the pictures will take care of themselves. Baseball in a small city in North Carolina. The guys hanging out up in the bleachers. I don't really know what this guy was doing. <laughs> but he seemed to know what he was doing. I suppose in the end that's all that matters. I love just, uh, you know, the great thing about being a photographer is you can do anything you just go do it. I mean, there's nothing that you have to do, and there are all these things you can do. I mean, how great is that? 
Here's the downside. You have to get up early in the morning. This was, this was one of those sunrise uh, foggy things. But you just, you know, like, okay, I'll get up early. This was a, I was at, assigned to photograph Phil Mickelson, the, the golfer, to do a story on his caddy, the guy that carries his bag around. And on the way to the first tee in the morning, we walk over the dewy grass, and I see all these footprints as, the, as they're all walking down. And they're kind of waiting for me. I said, don't wait for me. You guys go play golf. I'll catch up with you. I had my best picture by 6.30 in the morning. This is in a little tea shop in, uh, in Cueta. And this is what I, another thing I really love about being a photographer. And, and I'm told now that Cueta is not quite as hospitable as it was then. But I walked into this tea house and... Everybody's smoking. This is what I hate about all the no smoking in, the, in Europe and the States now, is you never get these God rays of light coming into cafes anymore because there's no, there's no smoke to light it up. But in this little place, the, uh, the tea was steamy, everybody's smoking, so the sun kind of comes bursting in, and this guy comes in and sits down at the table where I was, and I had my uh, camera out. And we had this sort of Groucho Marx conversation. It was like, my... Uh, my eyebrows talk to his eyebrows. It was like, no, how you doing? Oh, okay, what's going on with you? Right, oh, and I said, here you go, please do. And then, oh, have some tea. And we just kind of had this wonderful, non, completely uh, non-verbal chat, sip some nice tea, and, and I bracketed it big time. Because, like, how do you expose for something like this when you're shooting Kodachrome? I know, probably about 60 at 25, but... You know, nowadays you just look at the back of the camera, like anybody can do that. I traveled with Bill Gates to uh, India and then we went to South Africa. And this was when he was still flying business class. Next, sitting next to some guy that he didn't know, who was, uh, he was a South African law enforcement officer who'd been at a conference in Bombay and was just flying back. And, and people are like, ah. Bill Gates, the richest guy in the world, is actually sitting in business class, not first class, next to a guy he doesn't know on a 12-hour flight. So later on, his wife convinced him to buy a plane, and now he's, you know, with Warren Buffett, now he has his own airplane, but this was sort of the last time when that happened, and, um, you know, people were kind of giving me static, the people were going in front of him, like, that's Bill Gates, why don't you leave him alone? So why do you think I'm on the airplane? It's like, I mean, I'd be happy to go to South Africa, but I'm traveling with him. So it's okay, you can be protective, but just, like, stay in your row, you know. <laughs> so he works for a little while, and he's kind of, well, maybe snoozing off, and then about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got, you know, the richest man in the world, just another glove <laughs> under a blanket. <laughs> and this is, this is the photograph that won the World Press in 1979 from the <clears throat> Sakyo, uh, Thailand, refugee camp when the uh, Cambodian refugees were trying to escape the killing fields and it was pretty terrible and trying to find some way of saying that without rubbing your face in it is always I think the hardest thing to do when you're in situations of conflict or uh, people are under you know some kind of stress whether it be a hurricane or strife, civil war and I think trying to find some way to make the point that won't make the reader want to just turn the page out of discomfort is you have to find that little happy medium. So, politics. And here's another little lesson from Dave Burnett's Spiral Notebook, which actually has no spirals in it tonight, but one to remember. Own your own pictures. Don't give your pictures away. Keep your copyright. Um, that would be the White House in Washington, not a scene from Harry Potter, although I sort of love what those trees do. When I was 16, John Kennedy, about two months before he was assassinated, came through Salt Lake City. And once I started taking pictures, anybody that came to Salt Lake, like I was down there, I would either skip an afternoon of school or something. In this case, I went down in a mid week afternoon and just hung around in the hotel waiting for him to come by and to see what I could get. He was going to speak later that night in the Mormon Tabernacle, which is the big uh, convention uh, place that the Mormon Church has. And I'm, I've got a borrowed Petri flex from the camera store that I've worked in because my Pentax still hasn't come in yet. 
and it's not very good light. And I've got triacs that I've spooled myself because I didn't want to have to spend all my money on individual rolls. I buy 30 meters of film and I cut it into one and a half meter things. And, and it's pretty good to do that unless your dad comes in and turns the light on and while you're in the closet and says, what are you doing in there? Um, so, you know, I wasn't yet living the life of the globetrotting photojournalist, but, uh, so Kennedy comes in, I'm kind of like, click, 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 make my three or four frames. Went home that night, developed the film, and, you know, the French have a wonderful way of expressing things, and in this case, it was sort of best wrapped up as, uh, sous exclu et bougé. <laughs> Underexposed, blurry, out of focus. It was like the triad. And um, I looked at, I made one print, and I just, you know, I was like, I didn't think the framing was right, and I was just like, darn it. I probably said something a little stronger than that. Cut the negatives into fives, put them into a, a envelope that my mother had brought home from some nice New York hotel, put them in a shoebox, and the negatives sat in that shoebox for 35 years. And in uh, 1998, I was asked to do a, a presidential, an American president's exhibition. So I went back and I pulled this negative out. And I made a nice print. And I'm kind of looking at it. It's got, eh, I've seen it. It's got this rakish angle to it, you know, none of this straight up and down stuff. And it's got just enough blur that you see that John Kennedy is a vibrant guy walking through there. And, you know, nothing's going to slow him down. You know, you just don't know when you shoot him when your pictures are going to be good. Sometimes you have to wait 35 years, so don't give away your copyright. <laughs> this was the next day, and the little white strip across the bottom is not the barrier between the press and the people. That's actually when you load those films yourself and you don't quite get the cap on just right, the light sneaks in there. And it's amazing, you know, when, you're, when you think you can actually open something, see that it's screwed up and and close it faster than the speed of light. You know, only, <laughs> only photographers are capable of doing that. After college, I went to Washington. I had actually a summer job between my uh, third and last year of college, and I was spent some of that in Washington. And one of my assignments was photographing Lyndon Johnson speaking to the U.S. Congress. I didn't know any better. I actually thought they'd just put an ad in the paper for 54-year-old white men with glasses and suits to please come that night. And apparently all these people showed up. Brezhnev and Nixon. And so I sometimes have to remind people Nixon's the one on the right. You know, it's, you kind of forget we miss him. This was the day he resigned his resignation speech. Jerry Ford, and, you know, I kind of got into this political thing. I was a political science major, and even though I had studied a lot of political science, I had no clue about stuff that would actually happen. I'd always be amazed. I was like, you can't go. They actually chose Spiro Agnew as vice president? You know, things that you never, never could imagine. And the, uh, the bearded guy on the right side of that picture who's kind of looking like, oh, damn, I'm out of position, is Dave Kennerly, who... Uh, there aren't that many times when you actually get a picture showing Kennerly out of position, so I like to always include this one. Um, he became Jerry Ford's photographer, and actually that was about the last time that any photographers uh, were able to work for a president and help other photographers get in and, uh, and do pictures. Jimmy Carter standing on a chair in somebody's house in New Hampshire. And this is what's going on. This year it's actually started early, but normally this would be about when the campaign would start. Now the campaign's been going for almost a year, where these people who you absolutely think have no chance to be President of the United States will go to Iowa and New Hampshire and stand on chairs in somebody's kitchen, and eventually, incredibly, some of, some, one of them is actually going to get elected. This was uh, Reagan on a bus in uh, 1976. This was the year he didn't win, and he won the next time around. Reagan with Gorbachev in Geneva. Now, I'm actually a big fan of the non-interventionist school of photojournalism, which is to say, let life roll on, let it happen, I will capture it as it is. Every now and then, we have to roll that and roll back just the teensy weensy. Uh, I got in kind of at the last minute to the final press conference of the first meeting of 
Gorbachev and Reagan. This was a huge deal. It was perestroika and friendship between the two countries. And, and we get in, we kind of look up on stage, and there are these four chairs, two for the, uh, the Soviets and two the, for the Americans, each with their interpreter behind them in their ear, speaking in their ear. And the problem was the chairs were about a meter and a half apart. And if you were shooting with a 300, it just wasn't going to work. So a couple of other photographers and I uh, asked the Secret Service if we could go take a light reading. And we got up on stage and, you know, what are you getting, John? I got about, you know, 63.5. And, uh, you know, 125, 35, I'm going to push and stop. You know, we're kind of doing this thing. And as we're doing this, we're pushing the chairs closer <laughs> together. Because eventually the chairs kind of ended up in a place where you could actually shoot a 300 and get a picture. As I say, I don't recommend this on a daily basis, and I really would not want to uh, put this on the front of my CV, but, uh, you know, every now and then, stuff happens. What is also clear is, is you know, the campaigns, they're, they're trying to be nice to the press. They basically think we're as stupid as we think they are. So, you get off the, uh, the bus, and they have signs, or they'll have people... And, I mean, the staff easily is as dumb as we are. I mean, there's no question about that. You know, what did you do in the campaign? I held a staff this way sign in the cold. It was great. I got him elected. And so you get off the bus in these places, and uh, this was a, this is what is known as a agricultural event. Uh, this was in 1988 when Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, was running for president. So, like, you get off the bus, and there's uh, the guy that owns, you know, it's the son of the guy that owns the farm. They kind of bring in on the deal. You start to walk down to where the uh, little press area is. Press this way. Wait a minute. Today's my pool day. It's Tuesday. And, you know, the pool guys get to be a little closer and stuff. So then you carry on until you find the guy with the little pool thing. And, you know, today is your lucky day because you're going to get Michael Dukakis at a farm event. And then if you're really lucky, you'll get a picture of all the other farmers that showed up just to make sure that nothing happened. So politics can be pretty stupid. And, uh, you know, I once had a friend who described to me at the, in the end of the Soviet days, um, you know, we were talking about what kind of work you do and, you know, what's it like and how's it going. He says, well, I said, here's the deal. We pretend to work. They pretend to pay us. And presidential politics is really like that. Like, they pretend to have a campaign, and we pretend to cover it. So it kind of works out that eventually, you know, I think he was kind of, and you're telling me, which one of my sons is going to be president? This is uh, George Bush Sr. This was a uh, Larry King, who's the big American TV guy in the days when he had hair and was basically competitive with both Al Gore and Bill Clinton in the hair department. Uh, this was uh, Clinton's inaugural when I waited on top of a giant jumbotron TV screen about 20 meters high waiting for him to come in and stand and look at a model of the Liberty Bell. I was up there like five hours. And the position that I was given would have been great if Hillary had been the president. When George Bush was elected, I... Uh, it was a rainy, snowy, slushy, horrible day. And I went down to, uh, before they, they swarm in, and then they do the parade. And I, when I got down to where the parade was going on, they had one of these giant American flags, like 12 meters by 25 meters or something. And they had all these young uh, military cadets who were going to carry it. And they, uh, because it had rained, it was so wet, the thing weighed about four times what it usually weighs. So these kids are like trying to hold this thing up. And... And I discovered that if I stood under the flag, I was actually dry. So that was, that was a pretty good thing right off the bat. And, um, and I'm, I was under there for probably an hour, you know, making sure the cameras were all clean and everything. And at one point, they started moving. I said, I want to stay dry. So I ended up walking the entire inaugural parade route that day under the flag. And every now and then, like a little hobbit, I would kind of pop out of the flag and shoot a picture of something and then dodge back into my little lair, walk by the White House, the whole thing. It was really, I think I was the only person that day who actually walked the entire 
like the parade. Bush Cheney in the early days before 9 11. And a picture I made of the speech he did after 9 11, which was, you know, when we trace back to everything changing in the U.S. So today we get, some of us are able to go to the Reichs Museum. And uh, I have this thing in my head that if I ever get elected president, and I, I probably won't, but it's a better chance that somebody I know might get elected president, or some friend of mine. I mean, it could happen, probably won't, but if it does, when we take a picture of the president's cabinet and all the ministers, all the, the secretaries of this and that, that's how it's going to look. The, uh, the Amsterdam shooting club celebrating the Peace of Munster, 1648. I just think for it, photographing 25 people, there's no better way to learn how to do it than by studying this painting. I was glad that we could get a bunch of people over to see it today. Then all of a sudden, somewhere in the early part of the new century, I realized that all these people are looking at their pictures while I'm sort of holding my Ektachrome and Kodachrome and Fuji color film in my hand as we walk out of the same event. So I'm thinking, okay, I need to, I need to file that away. When the Gulf War started, when the Iraq War started, I, uh, I went up to the Hill, uh, to the U.S. Senate, Rumsfeld, and all the senior leaders were up there that day. And in addition to taking my regular cameras, I took an old speed graphic. I wanted to try and just come up with something that was maybe a little different than I might have just done with my cannons. And I love my cannons, they're great. But I was looking for a different perspective. And I shot this one picture, which because I had to shoot it at a tenth of a second, I got a little blur in it, and I started to think, gosh, maybe there's something here. So, I, in the 2003 part of the 2004 campaign, which was just four years ago, I started carrying this 4x5 camera around with me pretty much everywhere I went, looking for some way to get a picture that was a little different than I would have normally been shooting. This was a whole thing. So I'm kind of, now I'm starting to look like a used camera store. I've got these, uh, I've got a 60 year old speed graphic press camera with a lens that's 65 years old and one that's 80 years old. And man, do they do the job. Now, testing these things is not always easy because as I think I mentioned earlier, uh, at my house, uh, by the people who live in my house with me, I'm not actually referred to as master. And so, when I want to test a camera, I usually end up having to photograph myself. And I was trying to explain the other day how I do this, that I go into this little room on the edge of my studio where there's a swinging door, and I'll set the camera up, and I'll swing the door in, and I'll focus on the doorknob. And then I'll get the camera all set up, pull the thing out on the Polaroid, and go over right next to the door and then just move the doorknob and put my face there and reach over and take the picture. So I end up with a number of pictures that look sort of like this. The focus is not always spot on, I'll give you that. But I'm just trying to see what it, what it gives you. This is George McGovern who ran for president in 1972 and they just had a reunion party for him this summer. I had just gotten another one of these fabulous old lenses in the mail and I wanted to uh, see what it looked like. So I got him to pose for me for like four frames. Think about four by five, you really start to count every picture again. It's like real photography, you know? I mean, we get so spoiled with the ability to put in a four gigabyte card and shoot the equivalent of six or eight rolls. And you're just kind of like, you know, you become, uh, it's, I find it, I, I shoot too much because I find it so easy. There's nobody tapping me on the shoulder reminding me that I better not uh, overshoot, you know, and I, so I'm carrying a digital camera, for example, you know, when there is the amazing levitating water bottle, that's not something you're going to get with a 4x5, so you need, you need to have a, a digi cam or something that's a little more nimble. But I started shooting with all these other things, looking for some way after 40 years of taking pictures, something that will, uh, give me a little more enthusiasm and a little bit of a buzz, and so this is what I kind of looked like during the John Kerry campaign, where I spent a lot of days on the road with Kerry. Shooting with my uh, 10D Canon, a Mamiya 6 and a Holga on the other side, two big stupid bouncy uh, pouches of 4x5 holders on my belt, and then a little dance with the speed graphic. 
And, you know, you can do it, but I'll tell you, it's not easy. People just don't respect you, you know? <laughs> Some days are easier than others. But, uh, you know, this was a simple thing. is like John Kerry getting off an airplane in Denver. Like, okay, you just kind of line up, have a cigarette, read a magazine, and shoot it with your digital camera. Or, set the 4x5 up, crank it, roughly get it in focus, or in, uh, aim it right, check the aperture, come around, check your focus, and, uh, and you always have to do it because you're always holding the film in your mouth like that. <laughs> so I hope nothing curious happens. And then, uh, then you gotta wait. And then you're like, okay, I'm waiting. Oh, there's the great man now. <laughs> And then he comes down, snap, oh, damn, he's looking down, oh, that's picture. So that was it, my one frame, you know, and then, then I grabbed the, the digicam and, and make something. So it was beaucoup trial and error, and a lot of error, but a few really nifty pictures that came out. Now, this is a digi picture, you know, like sweeping thing, whatever, that's okay, that worked. A week later, after Kerry starts to win these things, and we're on the plane, and now he's the big guy. So I'm on the plane shooting for Time Magazine, Dave Kennerly, fresh from having covered uh, Jerry Ford 25 years before, is working for Newsweek. And they come back, and they usually do Time and Newsweek, they do, I don't know why they do it, but they bring us in together. So, okay, guys, come on up, you got uh, about three minutes for your cover shoot. Cover shoot, three minutes? So we wander up there, and I've got my little baby tripod, my little sack of 4 by 5s there, and I spend the first minute and a half looking at this sunlight coming through the window and burning a big hole on his shirt, thinking like, should I close the window? No, I'm going to lose all the light if I do that. All right, open it. Meanwhile, the is going, click, 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 I'm just everywhere. I mean, he's everywhere. I'm spreading the legs on my tripod. <laughs> and I finally make about six frames, you know, and it's like, it's like he's doing six of the and I'm doing ka <laughs> You know, the plane shutters, the air, con traffic, air traffic controllers are calling to make sure everything's all right on the airplane. But the next week, voila. So sometimes it is worth just taking a shot at something that makes you either feel good or you think might come through with something that's a little bit different. This is, uh, I did manage to go out with uh, Bush for a couple of days on the campaign. Pictures more than, well, I didn't have as much time on them, but that was a hot day, a hot, sweaty day in Florida. <laughs> Nobody cried at the Kerry campaign, I can tell you that. It was just interesting to kind of see, you know, the thing is, I'm now, with, I've got my lens synchronized to the viewfinder, so at 30 at 2A now, I can actually shoot it like it's a Leica or a Canon rangefinder camera, albeit one that took too many steroids, but, uh, this is a little digi thing on the road, and I kind of find that I can flow back and forth between uh, what I, you know, and people say, when do you know what? What, which camera are you going to shoot? It's like, well, whatever I look at and I just determine there's that artistic little thing that goes on, you know, how did Rembrandt know what to paint? Okay, I'm not saying I'm Rembrandt, but there is, each of us has our own sense of looking at a scene and immediately deducing what you can do with that scene, like John Kerry scaring small children, you know. <laughs> That's going to happen pretty quick, so you want to just be able, you know, there are things that happen in these little moments that you don't always have the ability to get with a big camera. Uh, you know, like, you know, soccer football is obviously really big in Europe. And I don't know if your politicians are very athletic and, and if they actually go out and play. These two women actually were on the U.S. national team. But, uh, there's, you know, I was going to write a memo. Dear staff, uh, you may not want to have him do soccer. Uh, you might try horseshoes. Uh, no one's going to vote for someone who looks like this. They're just... It's not going to happen. <laughs> Those votes will not be coming anytime soon. <laughs> but, you know, political campaign, I mean, what are you going to do? But then the next day, there's this little scene up in New Hampshire, and it's like, that is a moment for a 4x5 black and white. So, it's carrying a lot of stuff, and maybe carrying too much, and worrying too much about how you're going to shoot it. But I love having the... Uh, ability and the knowledge 
somewhere tucked away in the back of my brain that if, if I see a little scene that's just right, it'll work for me. This was at a Cary rally in Wisconsin, digital, same rally a minute later, four or five. And this is the one I really like, so that's the one I sent in. This is just a little series of portraits of uh, 2004 was the 60th anniversary of the Normandy landings, D-Day, and uh, I've been going up to those beaches for the last 30 years. My wife's, you know, kind of like, you're going to start to think you were actually there. <laughs> well, I don't think I was there, but I certainly have enjoyed meeting uh, the vets. This guy was a, a bomber pilot. And Time Magazine decided to do a big piece, and I got to go out and just find uh, half a dozen, or maybe it was more like eight guys, and photograph them in four by five. And, and the thing is, every assignment you do, you know, sometimes we get great assignments, and that's really great, you're lucky. But every assignment you do has the capability of becoming a great assignment if you only will it. Even the really crappy ones, especially the really bad ones, especially. Those are the ones that you have to, like, dig down deep and just come up with something. You know, anybody can go shoot a picture of something that's super photogenic. But when it isn't, then you gotta just try and make it happen. Not that this, I mean, I just thought that being in, with these guys, I would get some pictures and pretty much that worked out. It's actually Jerry Ford's lying in state at the U.S. Capitol. And I try and take, everywhere I go now when I take the camera, I'm taking that 4x5 with me and trying to get some other version of whatever else I'm going to do with it. This is Bob Williams, who, um, and I met him, this was 2004, and this is Bob Williams 10 years earlier on the 50th anniversary when he and a bunch of other 75-year-old paratroopers jumped again in France. And as they were walking off the field, another uh, 400 paratroopers jumped as kind of a tribute to them. Like that, you know, I woke up one morning, it was early morning on June 6th, and I think this was in 94. There's some guy who's just walked over from England with a flag. When I was in high school, I really thought I was a great sports photographer. I do football and basketball and baseball and didn't do much track, but uh, that's just because our school didn't do much. And I thought, when I was 20, I really thought I was like totally Sports Illustrated material. And like many things, the older you get, the more you realize you don't know, or the more you realize how bad you are. And uh, the unfortunate thing was that in all those years that I was doing that sports work, I felt that the important things in my life were to cover those events, to do the football game, to do the basketball game. When in fact, the most important thing I could have done as a photographer, especially as an 18 or 20 year old photographer, would be to photograph my own life. And those little everyday moments around me. That's the stuff that now I look back and I'm really sorry I don't have. Stuff with my family, uh, kids at school, hanging out at the malt shop. Not that I ever knew what a malt shop was, but uh, if there had been one, I'd have been there. But just those little things that make life special. And when you say, well, what, how can you make great pictures there? Well, if you really want to know, just go look at Cartier-Bresson's work or that of any of the classic photographers who did not really necessarily photograph a lot of events. Um, that said, I did start going to the Olympics in 1984 and have been to every summer game since then. Hope to go to Beijing. We're still trying to work that out for next year. This was uh, Seoul, Korea, 1988, and the fingernails belonged to Flo jo, Florence Griffith Joyner, who was who won, I think, three gold medals that year, and she won all the medals for, in the uh, fingernail category. This was the next games in Barcelona, that wonderful swimming pool on the side of a hill. Greg Luganis, the diver, the day after he banged his head on a rear dive on the edge of the, of the board, they had to shave a little spot on his head. Some unknown guy in uh, Sydney. I love the little holes in the swimming pools. They're just, I, I know a lot of really good photographers do scuba and they do cameras underneath them. I probably, uh, at some point, maybe I'll even do that, but if not, I mean, I, I just think what you can see by looking through those 
holes. It's like watching fish swim, except it's people. It's really great. This is Carl Lewis at the LA Games. Uh, Carl Lewis from a side position. And, and a year ago when we did this show, which we called Too Close, which was a series of pulled back images, we discovered this picture of Carl Lewis winning another event, but which his foot is just touching the line. And it's like a different way of looking at somebody winning a race. The big story of the 1984 games, besides Carl Lewis, was Mary Decker on the right, uh, who had been not allowed to go to Moscow for the 1980 games because of the American boycott. And in the women's 3,000 meters, she was the world champion, and several times world champion, but she wanted to win at the Olympics. And Zola Bud, number 151 in the middle, was the young South African woman who ran barefoot and who, uh, this was going to be the big head-to-head -head match. It was the last Friday of the Olympic Games at 5 o'clock. I had been spending much of that week of track and field down in the finish line with all these photographers with like 50 cameras and, and tripod set up with extra little uh, hoochie coochies on them to hold two or three or four other cameras. And it was just like too much. So I wandered down that afternoon and found a quiet little spot about the other 40 yard line, more than halfway down the track. And just looked around, there were two other photographers there. There was a nice place to sit, no one was gonna yell at me, and that's where I watched this race. And it's one of those races where you kind of position yourself so as they come around the last turn, you had your 400 eight catching and come around the corner because that was always a good way of stacking them up. They put the 400 down real quick and you grab the 85, and as they run about you know, eight meters away from you, five meters or something, then you just shoot them as they come across in front of you. And then you had to do this mental arithmetic super fast because they're coming back in 48 seconds. Do I have time to reload? Same with 36 exp uh, exposures, you really had to figure that for every lap. And if I had, if I had more than half a roll left, I'd go for it. But then you get like three laps into it and it's like, uh, okay, I'll reload and then you just reload really quickly and maybe you got it, maybe you didn't, maybe you, you know, you just never know. Now, you know, it's not an issue with these cameras that take so many pictures, but... So about the sixth lap, Zola Bud tries to make her move around Mary, and she's scooting around, trying to pass her, which she does right in front of me, and Mary is not really ready for it, and they trip and collide. And I'm watching this through the flicker of a mirror, so I'm not really seeing much, but it's like I see a little bit, I see a little bit, I see a little bit. Wait a minute, I think I see something that probably isn't supposed to be happening. Because it wasn't just more women running across the track. And um, by the fourth frame I realized this, this is not good. So the other runners go by, I put down the 85 and I grab the 400 again. And I'm showing you a slightly reduced sequence here obviously. And I just took that extra little hundredth of a second to tell myself to make sure it's sharp before you shoot. Just get her face sharp. And then, bing, 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 bing. And then all of a sudden the nurse comes. Mary gets up, turns around, looks down. And this is all within a couple of seconds. And then the moment was over. All the infield photographers came running over. They're standing around, blocking the thing. It was finished. And what's really interesting about a picture like this, I think, is that with all the proliferation of, of digital t TV technology at the Olympic Games, there never is going to be another moment like this. We just see everything too much, too clear, too full on. And the fact that this was kind of, first of all, a very uh, unpredictable moment made it a much bigger news event, the fact that it happened at all. But everything is so over-covered now, I just don't think there are going to be times when a picture like this makes it out of the Olympics. So then I've got this big sports bug through the 90s, and I keep, uh, you know, the, before the 96 games, I, I started shooting medium format, black and white. I, I still wasn't thinking, I, I bought a Linhoff, shot two frames with it, and I thought, this is way too heavy. I could never carry this. So I started shooting with my Mamiya medium format cameras. And... Again, just as a way of not having to shoot the same old picture, because very often things can start to look the same and you need to keep yourself fresh, you need to refresh the way you look at things. This was at an uh, Olympic training camp uh, match in Colorado Springs.
pen relays in Philadelphia, champion pole vaulter, steeplechase. And I ended up getting a 16-page essay in, in time before the uh, 96 games with this black and white work, and it was really fun. I mean, we just kind of went out and did it, and and for once, the material got used in a really great way. But it's kind of kept me going, and I, I uh, you know, every four years I start to fire up again, thinking, you know, what what's going to happen now, or what you know, what is going to be the big sport because. What is, what is interesting does tend to change every, every couple of years. Swimming and diving are really pretty cool. Basketball, fencing, a winner and a loser. That'll happen. Let's hear it for the uh, Dutch speed skating team. This was in Salt Lake City. Now, I don't really like to be cold and take pictures, because I think taking pictures is tough enough without being freezing. But I come from Salt Lake City, and I was kind of numb out into going back to uh, cover the Salt Lake City games by all these friends who said, well, you have to go back, you have to go back. It's your hometown. And I got hooked up with a group from the Salt Lake Olympic Committee that was doing a book with 10 photographers, and it was a really great experience. I mean, the great experience includes shooting color film on a day you thought you had Tri-X in there, so you put a yellow filter on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these things happen. And then you have to tell the scanners, don't clean it up. The first scan came back, it was completely silver. So no, you can leave it gold. It's, it was an artistic effort on my part. <laughs> I fell in love with uh, ski jumping. The wackiest group of people in little silver suits you're ever going to get close to. And because I was working for the book, I was able to uh, get a little closer to most photographers. Most of the photographers were either halfway down the hill or all the way down the hill, and I didn't even want to go down there. I just loved watching these little robotons pop up and down. And, you know, I think like, okay, I really, you know, it's back to this whole intervention thing. Do I need to tell him he doesn't have his skis on him yet? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to, he's going to do what he's going to do, people. You know, ski jumping is all about balance. So, and you know how a drunk will just see a bottle of scotch and go right to it? These people, well, okay, if you don't know that, that's kind of sometimes what they do, but um, ski jumpers, when they just see a perch available, they'll go, like, be on the perch and just practice balancing. That's what they do. They're, they have these little hinges in their tummy, and they're just ready to, like, lay them down on a hard surface and practice. You know, because it's like 100 meters straight down if he falls. And they're, you know, at the end of the day, they put them right back in the rack. <laughs> just to be taken out early the next day, warmed up, used again. Now this is what they have, this, it's even, the truth is even more weird. I mean, their coaches will stand there, and then, like they're having a hissy fit or something, the jumper will come running at them and leap into the air, sort of ballet style, and the coach grabs them by the waist, and lifts them up, and they count to like seven or eight, which is how long they would be floating through the air. Pretending they're, uh, I mean, imagine what's going through the jumper's head is like, okay, I'm really in the air, 100 feet up, I'm really in the air, I'm really in the air. <laughs> but it was, it was really uh, fun to see it up close. A little Hulk a moment with the sun poking through the trees. One of the places we could be was right under the, the uh, ramp where they come off the... Uh, they're, and they're coming off at 100, 110, 120 kilometers an hour. So you think, I'm a good photographer, no problem. So you're kind of standing there, and about where that speaker is, is where they come over your head. So you're ready, and you're ready, and you're ready. And the guy... <laughs> oh! And you haven't even pressed any button yet, let alone the shutter button. So then they, they figured out they could have one of the volunteers stand back over there watching it, and he would kind of count it down, you know, three, two, one, <laughs> they'd come shooting by again. And then actually, like the first 20 frames I shot were these skyscapes, you know, really beautiful blue, 
And then, by accident, I think I actually got a jumper in one shot. Now I'm starting to figure it out. Anyway, if you do this thing long enough, you can actually get somebody in the picture, but it's not easy. And this was one of those shots where I'm kind of looking down at the crowd, and the crowd is looking up at me, and uh, I mean, well, they're actually looking at the jumper. But through your lens, it's like 20,000 people are looking right at you. It's like, is my fly zipped, you know? <laughs> okay, they're not really looking at you, but... And then the overall... It's like... You just, I get air sick just looking at this picture. <coughs> The second guy on the right is my dad. I never saw him. Jesus. Sorry. I never saw my dad take a picture. But uh, two years ago, we moved my mother uh, from her apartment in Utah down to California. I found this incredible scrapbook of pictures from when he was between 18 and 21, his last year of college, and his, or high school and his first couple of years of college. And um, I looked at the pictures, and their pictures are so unbelievable. They're all made with these old folding Kodak cameras with the 616 film that would be, you know, about, I don't know what's that, about uh, six centimeters or something, I don't know, about five inches wide, four or five inches. You know, the prints are like so, and they're just contact prints. And they are beautiful. And these little team pictures, fantastic. And he had organized, when they had a picture of the baseball team, they had cut out each individual player and pasted it on the, on the paper in the order that they actually played, the position they played. And with a white pen, they wrote on the black paper. I mean, it, it is one of these incredible documents. Um, and I kind of I never even knew that these pictures existed until two years ago. And... I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure my dad took some of the other, obviously the ones he's in, he didn't shoot them, but I, I love the simplicity and the kind of formalism in these photographs. And I keep thinking, you know, if we could photograph today's modern athletic teams and make them look half as good as this, wouldn't we be on to something? Um, part of this whole thing I've been doing in the last couple of years with the big camera, I've also been taking into sports. This was uh, with a Polaroid sepia from the Sydney Olympics. And, you know, if you looked very carefully on your widescreen TV on the day they broadcast the games from Sydney, you'd have seen like 150 photographers at the finish line and a few guys over by the pole vault. And then one guy with a little Tupperware thing of water to keep the Polaroids in down by the running track for the javelin. That was me. So I started doing this series of uh, American athletes for the 2004 games who had a pretty good chance of maybe winning something in Athens. And basically it was just spend part of a day with each of these people. I did, I think, eight or nine of them. This was uh, swimmer Nellie Coughlin. The first year that women wrestling was in the Olympics and I did these women at the training center in Colorado. It was one of those things where we were looking around about 9 in the morning for a place to shoot. We walk up the outdoor stairs to a little mezzanine, and I see where the poles that hold the mezzanine up are making this incredible shape. And I just turned to the press guy and I said, I don't care where they are, get them here in the next five minutes. We've got to do this. This is the picture. And this is what I actually got used to. So even better, they ran it that way. Michael Phelps had won, like, you know, 58 gold medals or something. The Jacobson sisters, fencers, Laura Wilkinson, who's a diver who won the gold medal in Sydney, although she didn't do very well in Athens. But. And again, for me, it was like trying to find some other way of doing these portraits that would make a little something interesting out of it. This was Tom, um, I forget his last name, he's a uh, decathlon specialist. So they do, you know, javelin. Uh, discus, running, jumping, leaping. And this is just a simple triple exposure that, that I did. There's no, I mean, the real way to do this is in a studio with black paper and stuff, but we just did it outdoors with a piece of concrete. And even at that, I have gotten to where I like this picture. <coughs> Paul Hamm, the gymnast. 
Yagoshvili is, he's from Georgia, she's U.S., and uh, I think he actually writes for the U.S. now. And they're an amazing little wonder dog, who every time that we get ready for a picture, the dog will run over and sit down there. And they'd have to okay, come on, Sass, let's go. Come on. Ah, 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 ah. And the, the dog would run away, and then uh, just kind of watching me. I mean, I, I always had the feeling that the dog was there with like a cigarette in her <laughs> hand. And as soon as I would like grab the table release, the, she'd run back in and be in the picture finally, and just let her stay. Marion Jones, this is the day before she went to California to make her great proclamation in her press conference about how she didn't use drugs, which, um, well, she, she met it two weeks ago with a big lie. Uh, do a little baseball. This is a picture that only could have happened because of digital technology. I was walking along in the uh, outfield where the pitchers warm up, and there was a bleacher that was right elevated right next to where this guy's throwing. So I'm kind of standing up about two meters over where he is. And every time he throws, he's throwing it kind of close to me. I can't really look down at it, but I was doing what we call a Hail Mary, you know, and you just kind of hold the camera out. And as his arm would go by, I just go, Chew. and I'd shoot a picture. And I'd look at it, and I'd say, well, I'm a little high, a little low, I'm a little slow, a little fast. You could shoot 200 rolls of film and never know if you're going to get a picture. And by eyeballing it in the camera, I think this is about the eighth or ninth frame that I made and I had my shot. This is a little black and white baseball from spring training, which is a, it's one of those very American things that you go down to Florida and Arizona in March and the teams all are warming up and getting themselves uh, into physical shape for the season. And, all the talk starts going on about who's doing what and who got traded to which team. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful little American experience. And when I was at one of the camps, uh, this guy comes up to me and he sees my camera and uh, he kind of looks in the back and I had a red filter on, I was shooting black and white that day, I had a red filter on. He um, he looked at it and he's got a very heavy Cuban accent. Hey man, what is that? What is it? So well, you know, it's an old camera for an old photographer. And says, oh yeah, hey man, it's pretty cool, pretty cool. And I hear people are sort of yelling at him, it's Tony this, Tony that. And so I figure, okay, you must be Tony. I said so, Tony, uh, you got you know, Tommy doing him, Tommy Nuno con retrato. Says okay, man, okay, okay, I'm gonna go sign a few autographs first. So I said okay, I'm gonna be over by the picnic bench there. So I set my camera up by the picnic bench and I get him to come over with a bat. I found out about 10 minutes after I shot his picture that the very morning I was photographing that, that time, he was being voted on by the baseball writers as to whether or not he would enter the Hall of Fame, which he missed by two votes, which was really unfortunate. Tony Oliva was his name. And had he been voted in, I was ready. <laughs> And it'll still happen at some point, I hope. Lovely guy. Fencing at the Athens Olympics. Sometimes you, things happen so quickly that the only way to shoot them is to just totally slow it down. Fencing is too fast a sport. And you can see why they have the little electronic things to determine who scores because there's no way you can do it by the, by, really by the eye. And the only thing I will tell you for sure is that if I get to go to Beijing, I'm going to take an extra Vivitar 283 on a radio slave and have some guy always standing on the opposite side of the arena shooting into my frame. And whoever that person is, I really wanted to buy him a drink, but I don't know who it was, but kind of made the picture. Diving, trying to make something out of a dive that it isn't. The Belarus women's gymna women's, you know, they're like 14 women's gymnastics team being yelled at by their coach. Every Olympics has got to have a lot of guys in suits. That's really why they have the Olympics. It's so a lot of guys can put suits on and go stand in your way. Cuban runner. 
men's 200 millimeter or 200 meter breaststroke beach volleyball. I like not being one of those people. I try whenever I can to either get into the infield or to get to some other place. I don't want to just be uh, trying to get that same old classic shot. There's too many of these people who are so good they would just love me anyway. So I'm always trying to find that position or that look that is going to not be so obvious that everybody else is going to be there but might yield a, a good picture. This was New Zealand, Australia, uh, women's field hockey. Beach volley again. Some race. I have I have no idea what race. I didn't really care. This was a new sport they introduced uh, called equestrian basketball. <laughs> Apparently it's pretty popular, but uh, they can't figure out if uh, the horses have to wear the Adidas shoes or not. It's kind of a contractual problem I have. This was a a Ukrainian uh, high jumper. High jumpers are great. They're like they're like ski jumpers. They're really out there in their own little zone. Just trying to capture that tension before they before she runs. Fifty meter freestyle. Chinese uh, women's synchronized swimming team. And it's particularly hard to shoot something like this on a 4-5 because you, when they go into the water, you have no idea where they're going to come up. And I, this one definitely was just a nice bit of luck that it worked out. That's Carly Patterson, the American uh, gold medalist in gymnastics. The Cuban women's volleyball team. And if they say, like, come on over while we practice spikes and you can catch them, tell them you're busy. They'll spike the ball right through you. They have this weird sport called synchronized diving. And the winning jump and the pole vault. I make that one shot, 125 at 2.8, tri X. And I'm not shooting, you know, I've got it all set up. I think I'm focused to where it will be sharp when he gets over the thing. And the funny thing about these cameras is they make a lot of noise. They've got a big spring-mounted shutter in there. And since you're not actually looking through the viewfinder, you don't really see that flicker at the moment that you're shooting. But in the same way that if you've ever been to a, a, a big rocket or space shuttle rocket launch, when the shock waves start to hit you, uh, they just kind of pop off your body like that. And when you're shooting a camera like the speed graphic, when you fire it, whatever it is you're looking at, the sound of that camera just kind of pops against your body, and at that moment, your mind will see what you're looking at, and you can kind of see if you've got it or not. It's a weird thing, but I knew I had a picture as soon as I heard that noise. Yeah, I'm just... So the last group of pictures are from New Orleans and the post-Katrina storms. Uh, 2006, and I, I was asked by the Geogra National Geographic to go down and see if I could come back with something, and I had been showing around my large camera work, and uh, they wanted me to try something. So once again, I was kind of shooting with the digital cameras, and very often just using the digital cameras as like a little uh, chalkboard to, to see how things look, you know, kind of shoot a frame, see what it looks like in two dimensions, and then I carry on and shoot. Now this was actually three different four by five frames uh, stitched together to show uh, what the lower ninth board looked like. Holly Beach, which was in the western part of Louisiana, which was, this used to be 500 homes. Now there's nothing left but a few, literally a few sinks, toilets, and some garden hose. And Biloxi, Mississippi, the floating casino was carried by the water up and over the highway onto the land, and because they couldn't refloat it again, they had to uh, just tear it down in place. These just amazing scenes that you couldn't imagine. You drive by and you see a family, a whole family's life out on the street like this. It was just, you know, I, I was at a point for a while when I, 
um, had a driver, a photographer who was driving, and we'd be driving, and every few minutes I'd just make him stop because I didn't want to, I felt like I was disrespecting the, uh, the ground by just driving through it without stopping to, to look. This is an automobile uh, salvage place. A woman whose house just barely survived and they're rebuilding. Two women from the Holiday Inn in Gulfport, Mississippi, who lived in the hotel. They lost their homes and they just stayed on there and kept the place going. Dauphin Island, Alabama, which is a beach town and which had these big houses up on stilts so that they would be protected. And the water and the wind just got under them and I don't know where they ended up, but probably you know, 10 kilometers north, nowhere near where they started. The water would go up, houses would float away, and then the water would finally dissipate and the house would come down, wherever it would come down, in this case, on a car. This guy went back to his house and found his kids' clothes there, and just hung them up there, and said, I just wanted people to know that life doesn't always turn out like you expect it will. Somebody's living room. <clears throat> they had to get rid of all the old refrigerators and freezers, and one guy at this yard where they did that collected all the magnets and just totally covered his car with them. <clears throat> Workers at the sugar factory living in trailers near the factory because they all lost their job or their houses. Herb Getridge, who lived in the Lower Ninth Ward, and who I met him the day he went back into his house, and he's managed actually to rebuild. He's one of the few people who's rebuilt his house and is living there. But when we walked into the bedroom, and I saw all of these clothes, he had his suits were all wrapped in plastic. He had hats and old hat boxes going back from decades, and everything had been under ten feet of water for two weeks, so it was all basically just dust. Just about, just about cried. One of the storm surges broke a part of a levee and pushed all this sand through a neighborhood and just covered everything in sand. Mud filling up a church. This is the house of a, a U.S. Senator from Mississippi. This is all that was left of his house. Bank building in Mississippi. This is a family in Florida who had been living in FEMA trailers. These are these relief trailers. and um, I spent a day with them just to kind of get an idea of what life is like in these trailer villages. This is one of the daughter with her best friend and their son. Even in the cemeteries, because nothing can be buried in New Orleans because it's so close to sea level, all the tombs started to float around. This one just landed on a, another tomb, another headstone. The family from Slidell was living, they were in about their eighth month of living in a motel room in, uh, in Baton Rouge. view of the city from one of those canals that overflowed. That's it. Thank you all very much.